Okay, we're at eight o'clock sharp. So good evening, everyone. My name is Nora, my son name is Nora. And I'm one of the members of the Irish Tech Research Network. Just before I start with the introduction for Robert, I just want to explain a little bit briefly first about this evening. Um, we would ask that everyone continue to leave their cameras off for the moment during the presentation. Once the presentation is over, for Q&A, we can switch on the cameras. We will be recording the presentation. Once the presentation is finished, we will stop recording. We won't be recording the question and answers at the end. Okay. Is that okay with everyone? Great stuff. So I want to start by introducing Robert. Sorry, I'm going a bit blurry. Sorry, one second now. Yeah, the focus is just, it seems to be auto-focusing. So Robert has been working in the area of computers and technology, and then over time he got involved in the Irish Deaf Society. And that's what brought his interest in language and Irish sign language, and the research moved on from there. He's working on a corpus for linguistics, for ISL. He's a lecturer at the moment in TUD in Blanchardstown. And in recent months, has just finished his PhD. Congratulations. Simply looking at the area of non-manual features in ISL, facial expressions. And he used the ISL corpus there in terms of use for analysis. As you all know, we have the Signs of Ireland corpus here. Lots of different video samples of people signing from all different generations. And that's all gathered together. And he's been analysing that. So his PhD has been focused on NMFs. And this evening he is going to specifically talk about grammar classes. For example, verbs, nouns, and how we pass them together. So I'm really interested in looking forward to this presentation. So without further ado, Robert, I will pass over to you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I'm going to use English, if that's OK. Um, so um, it's great to be here. Um, and I want to thank the seminar committee for inviting me to present uh, today. Uh, sorry, my monitor is over here, so I'm going to be looking to the side a little bit. Um, so as I said, um, as Nora said, my name is Robert Smith, uh, and I'm going to talk to you about the distribution of grammatical classes in the Signs of Ireland Corpus. So this is some of the exploratory work from my PhD research. Um, some of it is in my PhD dissertation, but some of it um, didn't make it in. Uh, we had to do a chop at the end and cut a few pages out. Um, so... So get my mouse to work here. So um, by way of introduction and background, um, today I'm going to discuss some frequency distributions. OK, so hope it doesn't sound boring. Um, I hope like me, you're into this stuff and um, we'll, we'll have a nice uh, presentation together. Um, I. Uh, I suppose the purpose of this presentation is that I want to promote the data that I created as part of my uh, sign language research at my PhD research. So um, I have a huge body of data now generated from the Science of Ireland Corpus uh, that can be used to um, analyze the language in the way that I'm going to show you today. OK, um, the data is open source and it's free to use. Um, and I hope to show you how useful it is. So maybe we start off by looking at what a grammatical class actually is. Um, so the literature says that grammatical classes are near synonymous with terms like parts of speech or word class or lexical category, grammatical category, syntactic category, and so on. So these are not all actually the same thing, um, but they're often used interchangeably, um, these terms. Um, so um, it's useful maybe to um, consider them as quite similar for the sake of what I'm talking about in this study. 
So this work that I've done builds on the grammatical classes described in the Auslan Corpus Annotation Guidelines, uh, which will be seen as uh, the Auslan Corpus is one of the front runners of sign language corpora uh, in the world. Um, and Trevor Johnson's work is very well respected. So he suggests using these particular grammatical classes um, for um, the Auslan Corpus and for other corpora. Um, you can see there's quite a few classes here. Um, you get the typical types of parts of speech like uh, adverbs and adjectives. Oh, sorry, let me turn my little laser pointer on. Um, adjectives and adverbs and conjunctions and determiners and so on. But you can see actually that nouns and verbs are actually split up into um, smaller categories. Um, and, and that's really nice for what I want to do because if, if I tag uh, verbs as uh, depicting uh, verb, for example, or verb finger spelled or verb indicating directional, then later on, uh, if I want to just look at verbs as a, a wider category, I can just bunch all these together and um, analyze them as one category. Um, but it's harder to do it the opposite way around. It's more difficult if I was to tag all of these as just verb and then later on try to um, subcategorize them. So um, it's a bit of work annotating um, the corpus with all these different categories, but it's worth it because it's kind of more finite uh, annotations. Um, and... Um, just, just to note, I suppose, uh, the likes of parts of speech uh, includes, you know, nouns, verbs, adjectives and so on, but it doesn't include gestures and interact and boy and that kind of stuff. Um, so grammatical classes is probably a better term uh, for what I'm trying to do. OK, so um, obviously the idea of tagging all these grammatical classes so that I can explore them um, um, as part of the work. Um, and it's difficult, I think, to 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 analyze a language with uh, certain aspects of a language without um, tagging these grammatical classes first. Or it's difficult to compare between languages or to process languages computationally uh, without having these grammatical classes. So let me just, uh, I suppose, explain that further with an example. So in this example here, um, we can see in this graph that um, our sign language here is the orange uh, line and English is the blue line. So this graph compares some grammatical categories from ISL against English. And what we can see here is that there's more uh, verbs and pronouns for our sign language um, in this particular example. And there's less nouns, adjectives and adverbs for our sign language. So what might be the reason for this? Uh, well, I suppose my PhD work wasn't focused on exploring differences between English and uh, our sign language, but I did find some evidence to suggest that a high frequency of depicting verbs, which would be part of this verb category, um, it does have an impact on the frequency of nouns, adjectives and adverbs. And that seems to be borne out in this particular graph here. Um, so as interesting as that is, it's not the point of this slide. The point I'm trying to make here is that um, these grammatical categories can be very useful for uh, comparing between languages and, and, and exploring various grammatical classes. Um, and, you know, to support that, I have a further example here on the next slide. Uh, in this example, this pie chart here, um, I have content signs and I have function signs. Mm -hmm. And um, content signs include signs like nouns, verbs, adjectives, and so on. And function signs include signs like prepositions, articles, conjunctions, and so on. And the, the job of those kind of signs is to kind of gel together a sentence. It's it's they're functional um, to make a sentence work, whereas the actual subject of the sentence, uh, the information of the sentence, is all in these content signs. So. I found that the data had 65% uh, of the data of the, the, the grammatical classes were considered content science, uh, which means that um, our sign language is what we call lexically dense or lexically dense language. And the same thing was found in previous research for American sign language, British sign language, Auslan and New Zealand sign language. So that was uh, it's quite nice to know where part of that group now. Um, they were the only uh, four languages that had 
a similar analysis uh, done um, before I did my, my analysis in 20, it was 2020, I did that analysis. Um, interestingly enough, spoken English um, has a low uh, lexical density. So it's a lexical density of less than 40%. So these sign languages seem to be, seem to behave quite differently um, to uh, spoken English at least. So again, as interesting as that is, um, the point here is to show you how we can find out some of these interesting things with the data. Okay, so let's go back for a second and have a look at um, kind of what research has been done and who's researching in this area at the moment. So by this area, I mean sign language linguistics, um, preferably around grammatical classes, but sign language linguistics in general. So what I'll do is I'll discuss some uh, key examples of uh, publications in this area, uh, but then it's definitely not all of It's not an exhaustive list. It's not all the examples. So before the Signs of Ireland Corpus was developed, um, the first person um, to study Irish Sign Language was La Master. She was interested in um, uh, gender variations in Irish Sign Language. Um, and then, you know, Leeson uh, started doing a bit of work around this time. And uh, Pat MacDonald, um, he was the first person to look at grammatical classes. He looked at classifying verbs in uh, his PhD dissertation. Uh, and then there's uh, there's a few more. A Boyle and Matthews book was quite significant at the time. Uh, Leeson's PhD thesis, and then uh, Leeson and Graham started looking at gender variants again. Um, and then after the Signs of Ireland Corpus was developed, there was uh, more research. The research in the area kind of grew because the data set existed. It was there, and you can see that Leeson, uh, Lorraine Leeson, is quite prolific here. She does most of the work in this area. Um, um, Carmel Graham's done a bit, uh, and there's a few other people here, and, uh, and my name is tagged on here at the end, so I'm now on this list, I'm happy to say. Um, so the point is, there, there, have, there has been some research in this area, and it's been some significant research, but it's still not a huge amount of research, and we can say maybe that uh, Irish Sign Language is under-documented uh, for this reason. Uh, like you'd find a, a, a wider body of research, for example, for American Sign Language, than you would for Irish Sign Language. Um, of course, there's more examples of research in the areas of applied linguistics or computational linguistics or, um, you know, interpreter studies and so on. Um, but they're a little bit less relevant to what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to make here. So in Leeson and Saeed's book in 2012, um, which gives a linguistic description of Irish Sign Language, Leeson said that the linguistic description of ISL is still in its infancy. Okay. And, and I'd be inclined to agree with that still uh, in 2024. Um, and I suppose to maybe understand that quote, we need to look at it in the context of the history of linguistic study. So the next slide, I've created a lovely timeline here. I hope you can see it mm -hmm. properly. It, it doesn't look great on um, the screen now. That, um, but you can see that the, the linguistic study of any language started about 4,000 years ago in uh, Babylonia where they uh, started comparing lists of uh, languages to see um, how translations worked and so on. Uh, and, you know, that was followed by various traditions like the Hindu and Greek and Roman traditions of linguistics, all the way up here to about 200 years ago, where there was uh, modern linguistics. So modern ling linguistics was founded about uh, 200 years ago. And you can see there, there's, 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 there's a huge amount of work before we even got to modern linguistics. And this whole area here is getting quite cluttered because all of this stuff down the bottom is sign language research. And this happens uh, right here at the end. So all of this work happened before this. So let's just zoom in on this particular area here for a second. And you can see here uh, a few years after modern linguistics, William Stokey, um, Kind of forced, argued for um, sign language, particularly American sign language, to be uh, a, a recognized as an actual language. Um, you know, you put arguments forward to say that it wasn't just a gestural system um, or a pidgin language, it was a full language in its own right. Um, so, until really linguists recognized sign languages as languages, there was obviously no study done um, from a linguistic perspective. 
Um, so Lunaring started in the 1960s, and then it was a couple of decades after that that Le Master started looking at Irish Sign Language, and it was another decade or so after that when Pat McDonald started looking at um, categorising verbs, which was the first work really on um, grammatical classes for Irish Sign Language. So we can see we're a bit behind in that um, the study of sign language started about 4,000 years after the study of spoken language. Uh, and about 200 years after um, modern languages, so or modern linguistics, sorry. Um, so I suppose in that context, you can see all the study of all sign languages are in their infancy uh, compared to spoken languages, but particularly our sign, lang sign language is a little bit slow off the mark. And we're a couple of decades in um, before we uh, anybody really started investigating our sign language. So what do we know? Um, well, Obal uh, and Matthews and Lisa and Saeed's books gave a pretty solid account of um, our sign language, a linguistic account of our sign language. And particularly um, Lisa and Saeed's book offers a full chapter on uh, syntactic categories, which, you know, are quite similar to these grammatical classes that I'm talking about. But there's no publications that explore how prevalent these categories are in the language. And this is quite significant, I think, because it allows researchers to understand how, um, you know, these grammatical classes and other uh, linguistic phenomena are used in day-to-day um, -day life. So it was sufficient, um, say, in 2000, when Oval and Matthews wrote their book, to uh, identify linguistic phenomena or signing strategies and give some demonstrations of those and just say these exist and this is what they look like. Um, whereas now we know that. So, so we're more interested to say, right, these exist. How do they work? How are they used? Um, and we need to know that type of information so that we can compare with other languages uh, and to direct research in the future. OK, so let's move on to the data set that I use. Um, I'll just uh, introduce the data set and then we can get into some of these um, frequency distributions. So I used a portion of the Signs of Ireland corpus. Um, so I used about 30 percent of the Signs of Ireland corpus um, for my data set. And you can see over here in the table on the left, that's about um, 18,000 tokens in total, um, or um, about just under 3,000 lexical gloss tokens. So a lexical gloss token is just an English description of a sign. Um, so each lexical gloss token, could, we can say, represents a sign. So there's about three, just under 3,000 signs um, in this data set. Uh, it's about half an hour of video. Um, I tried to keep this demographic balance uh, in the way that it was in the original corpus. So I've got nearly 50, 50 males and females. Um, I've got the same age range as was in the original corpus. And I've got almost all the geographical areas. I've got four counties in there. So we could say that this was a, a quota based random sample uh, in that I tried to um, I tried to keep the demographic balance, uh, but I didn't actually look at the contents of the videos when I was selecting uh, the videos. So um, when I had selected that subset, I annotated then, um, I added 5,372 annotation tokens to the corpus. Um, and that's the reason why I only was able to use 30% of the corpus because it took a long time obviously to um, annotate uh, that many tokens. <clears throat> so I annotated for uh, grammatical class on the left hand and the right hand. So you can see here is a, a, a little screen grab of the um, Elan tool. And you can see that there's um, the lexical gloss tier, which was already there. And I added a right hand grammatical gloss tier and a left hand grammatical gloss tier. And I tag tagged each tier for each grammatical, um, or, or for each lexical gloss. And you see their time aligned and so on. Um, so uh, later that was abstracted and um, um, put into various uh, symbolic units. And I'll explain those symbolic units a bit later on. Um, so let's 
move move along a little bit here and, and talk about uh, frequency distributions. So the first frequency distribution here is uh, a distribution of grammatical classes across the dominant hand. Okay, so this is how often uh, depicting verbs were used, for example, on the top here, and how often um, you find uh, plain nouns uh, in the data set and so on. So this is just a count of each of these grammatical classes. Um, I'll give you a second to have a look at this, and, and then I'll talk about it a little bit. Okay. So um, you'll note, I think, that uh, depicting verbs and plain nouns at the top there are uh, significantly more common than the next most common uh, class, which was pronouns. Um, I think plain nouns are a bit easier maybe to isolate and to teach people um, who are learning sign language uh, or sign language for the first time. And for that reason, they're easier to represent in a sign language dictionary. You know, you might have a sign for book and you teach someone to sign for book and that's it. It's, it, it's an easy sign to learn. This is the sign for book done. Um, and it's easy then to represent computationally as well. So if you're going to translate from the English word book to uh, ISL for book, then um, it's pretty straightforward. It's a one-to-one -one connection or whatever. Um, if you want to recognize a sign for book using uh, uh, computer vision technologies, or if you want to synthesize using avatar technologies, um, it's pretty straightforward to do these uh, plain nouns. But depicting verbs are much more difficult. So um, depicting verbs include classifier constructions. Um, and, you know, these are complex structures and they're much more difficult to understand for new signers who are learning how to sign for the first time. And therefore, they're difficult to represent in a sign language dictionary and they're uh, difficult to represent computationally. So all of these different um, uh, sign language processing applications find it difficult to understand uh, depicting verbs. Actually, there was, a, there was an author um, called uh, Helen Cooper who published a paper in 2011, that's 13 years ago. Um, and she outlined the challenges for sign language processing projects. And in, in that list of challenges, she listed adverbs, uh, placement, classifiers, directional verbs, positional signs, uh, body shift, and, and, and a, few other, um, a few other things. Um, and obviously depicting verbs is included in that. So that was 13 years ago, and those topics are still a challenge today for uh, sign language processing. Um, and I've, I've, I've added up all of those areas, uh, those challenges that uh, Helen Cooper listed um, from the data set, and I found that 46% of all of the signs in the data set fall into those challenging categories. And that's quite a significant amount of science you know you're talking nearly half of the language or half of certainly half of the language that was used in in the data set that i had um wouldn't be uh or would be considered challenging from the point of view of sign language processing which means sign language processing applications aren't ready to process that type of data just yet um so from what we see here on the slide it's just um numbers it's just uh distributions but there's quite a lot of meaning in there and um we can um we can learn for example that a huge portion of our, our sign language is going to be very very difficult to process computationally and therefore maybe i think um processing this type of data is a little bit of a way off yet because there's still open active challenges. That's not to say that there's, there's, there's not people working on these challenges or there hasn't been some successes in these challenges, but there's still open challenge areas. Okay, so uh, this next distribution is uh, the same as the last slide, except for, it's the, for the non-dominant hand. So it's a distribution of grammatical classes across the non-dominant hands. So I'll give you a second to have a look at this one.
Okay. So we can see that um, these grammatical classes are they're less frequent on the non-dominant hand. Um, and I think significant here, or most significant here, is the large value for null at the top, the very first item here. Um, and what null means is that there was no annotation value entered for the non-dominant hand. So let me just show you here. Uh, this is the example from uh, an earlier slide. Um, so you can see for the sign frog here, for example, there's a plain noun uh, on the done on the right hand, and um, it's there's no sign for the left hand because frog is a finger spell one handed sign. Um, so what that means is that uh, for 1,151 signs or 39% of all of the signs, um, there's no annotation for the non-dominant hand. So what does that mean? The data doesn't tell us why this is the case, but it does tell us that 39% um, of those signs are going to be one-handed signs for whatever reason. It um, doesn't mean that they're naturally one-handed signs. Mm -hmm. It just means that there's no annotation in the non-dominant hand. And if we were to if we were to explore handedness, you could go back into the data and have a look at why, why that's the case. So the next couple of slides, I actually <clears throat> explore handedness a little bit more. Um, this slide here shows the information from the previous two slides. And I put them together here so it's easier to draw comparisons between the two hands. Um, <clears throat> so in all cases, except for boy, so boy is at the top here, um, and null, which is at the bottom down here, um, the count for the dominant hand is greater than it is for the non-dominant hand. So that means um, it, it, that's because of all the, the null values, I suppose, for the non-dominant hand. Um, the data indicates which grammatical classes are often uh, or most often uh, performed one-handed, I suppose. So you can see here, for example, for uh, plain nouns in the middle here, um, almost half of the time they're performed one-handed, whereas pronouns, most of the time they're performed one-handed and depicting verbs, uh, most of the time they're performed two-handed. So this, this graph, I suppose, indicates if a hand is dropped, um, that it's going to be dropped on the non-dominant hand in the vast majority of cases. And it indicates that the dominant hand is the leading hand and there provides maybe a clearer picture of which grammatical class is being used um, for a particular science. This distribution, um, this is the distribution of whole signs across the dominant and non-dominant hands. Again, I'll give you a, a couple of seconds and have a look at this before I explain it. Okay. Um, so maybe uh, before I... <clears throat> delve into the data, I should explain what a hold sign is because that's a term that I used in my uh, thesis. So hold signs are signs, sorry, my light is falling over. Um, hold signs are signs that were, uh, where a preceding sign is carried over into a succeeding sign. Um, so here, <clears throat> here's an example from the previous, uh, previous slide. Um, where a, a depicting verb is held. So in this example, there's a boy asleep um, and the um, the signer keeps the non-dominant hand on the face in, in the sleep pattern to, to show that it's the boy sleeping and then signs dog with the uh, dominant hand and shows the dog jumping up and lying on top. Of, lying on top. Um, so that's an example of how hold signs are used for partitioning, um, in this case, um, but there's examples where whole signs are used for various other types of boys and so on as well. And at this study, you know, boys generally understanding boys and how they're used um, is outside the scope of this study. So um, I didn't bother trying to differentiate between the boys. I just used hold, uh, um, the, the, the keyword hold. Uh, also, by using the keyword hold, uh, it allowed me to keep the, the grammatical class and know which grammatical class was being held. So, for example, because I've done that, now I can say things like depicting verbs are the grammatical class that's held most often. 
and it's held most often on the dominant hand and the non-dominant, uh, sorry, the dominant hand and the non-dominant hand. Um, and also I can say um, that the non-dominant hand um, is where hold signs are most often seen. Um, I found that 8% of all hold signs, uh, or sorry, all signs in the data set are hold signs. Um, so we take that 8%, and added to the 39% of null signs from the earlier slide, that's 47% of all signs where there's a difference between the, what the no, do, dominant hand is doing and what the non-dominant hand is doing, which has a, um, a, an impact then maybe on symmetry um, and, and exploring symmetry. Um, this doesn't include asymmetrical signs. It's just uh, whole signs and signs where the non-dominant hand is not engaged at all. <clears throat> so it has something to say maybe about boys, placement, um, depicting signs, partitioning, and so on. Um, but it definitely needs uh, some further investigation. So this is where this kind of data is useful because it, it, it highlights areas that are interesting and, and, and worth further investigation. Um, so here's a further distribution on uh, for finger spells across the dominant and non-dominant hand. Um, unsurprisingly, here I think finger spell signs are most commonly seen for nouns on the dominant hand. Uh, but what is interesting is that finger spell signs were also seen in other grammatical classes and some uh, in some cases for nouns on the non-dominant hand, which again is uh, interesting. Um, okay, so um, that's, I suppose, the distributions that I have for um, grammatical classes. Um, I did I did have some distributions for various demographics like uh, gender and so on, but I, I don't have time to include them here. Um, and I think maybe there's so few examples of different genders that it, it's not particularly reliable data anyway. Um, so um, I'll move on to symbolic units then. Um, so let's explain first what they are. Um, this beautiful graph uh, here um, shows the relationship between symbolic units and various grammatical classes. So at the bottom here, you have all of these symbolic units. Um, so earlier I talked about function signs and content signs. They would be considered symbolic units. Okay, symbolic units are just they're just broad categorizations uh, um, that we can group. Um, grammatical classes into. So we look, say here, for example, um, for this uh, function sign here, this is dark blue color. Um, you've got various lines uh, coming out of uh, function here. So if we follow one of those lines, uh, you'll see we get to uh, pronoun um, and locative, and then over here, auxiliary determiner and so on. So all of the grammatical classes that are part of uh, the functional symbolic or function symbolic units are uh, li listed here, and then you have um, content signs. We have partly lexical, fully lexical, and non-lexical signs, pointing signs, depicting signs, um, and I've I've put noun and verb in here as well because these are, these are broader categories. So these are these are all just broader categories um, that I can dump some of these grammatical classes into for the sake of analysis. Um, okay, so if I look at the distribution then, yeah, if I look at the distribution then of um, some of these symbolic units, I start looking at verbs and nouns. Um, interestingly, uh, a defecting verb was the most common um, verb type in the data set, uh, followed by plain uh, verbs. Um, then uh, um, indicating verbs uh, came next, so they're split into uh, Location uh, indicating location and indicating direction, uh, which are two slightly different um, variants of indicating verbs. And then uh, for nouns, we had um, plain nouns were uh, nearly three quarters of all nouns were plain nouns. And then there was some depicting nouns there as well. Um, some locate locatable nouns, um, finger spell nouns, and, uh, and sign names. Um, okay. 
So um, the next distribution I want to look at is the distribution of lexical items. Okay, um, so these were these these are three different symbolic units uh, which kind of denote the lexicality of a sign. So before I show you the distribution, I probably need to describe them um, first. So <clears throat> um, the first one is a phonetically constrained um, sign. Okay, uh, which. Johnson and Shembury in their literature, they call it a lexical sign. Okay. Um, Mary Brennan call it an established sign or a frozen sign. Uh, and Lisa and Saeed use that terminology in their book. Um, and these are signs like shop, mother, uh, walk, and so on. So these are signs where, for example, if you sign shop up over to, to the right side of the head, it, it's no longer the sign for shop anymore. OK, um, so it's it's constrained. It has to be signed in a certain place um, and same with mother and walk and so on. Uh, I know there's certain um, uh, there's certain um, the certain allowances for that rule. But in the vast majority of cases, the sign for shop and mother and walk are um, they're, they're structured, they're constrained and they can only happen in a certain way. The next category then is phonetically unconstrained uh, signs. So these are what Johnson and Shembury call partly lexical signs. And Brennan called them the productive lexicon. Uh, and again, Lisa, Lisa and Saeed's book uh, used this terminology too. So these include things like classifiers or depicting signs, pronouns, uh, uh, signs that denote location and so on. So um, these are partly lexical because there's certain rules there's certain rules that have to be followed but then there's lots of uh, aspects of the sign that don't follow any rules so for example if you're using a pronoun um, you might have to um, point in a certain way uh, but you can point in a number of different directions so the direction is not confined or if you're using classifiers you might use classifier hand shapes but you can move around the signing space in lots of different ways so they're phonetically unconstrained uh, or partly lexical. Um, then uh, the third category then is non-lexical. So these are signs that are not in the lexicon at all. Uh, and these would be because these are basically gestures and interactive signs. So uh, Lisa and Saeed call these the gestural substrate. Um, and these are things I found. I looked through the signs of Ireland Corpus to find examples of these, and I found examples of a sign of rubbing their hands together in anticipation, um, or uh, hands up saying where. Um, so, for example, instead of using the sign for where, hands up, where, uh, or hands up in frustration, uh, being annoyed. Um, so these are gestures, they're not actually signs, certainly, they're communicating some meaning but they're not signs that you would find in a sign language dictionary or, or a sign language dictionary. So now that I've, I've defined these different uh, lexical symbolic units, let's take a look at their distribution. So this, um, on the left side here, you can see partly lexical signs um, make up 46% of the data set. Fully lexical signs make up 45% of the data set and non-lexical signs only make up 4% of the data set. Um, so again, if you're exploring lexicality, this is really interesting stuff. Um, but also, if you're um, interested in uh, sign language processing um, computationally, um, then the likes of this partly lexical stuff should be quite scary because 46% of the signs in the database are going to be difficult to replicate using uh, technology or to translate using technology and so on. Um, okay, so the last distribution uh, that I have to go through is um, depicting and pointing signs. So uh, pointing signs make up 22% of the data set while depicting signs make up 23% of the data set. And, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about them in a second, actually. Uh, so pointing signs, 22% um, are pointing signs. That's uh, pronouns, locatives, determiners, and, and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, and of course, pointing signs are quite common in um, our sign language. And, you know, 22%, I think, reflects that. 
in a separate analysis, uh, I did a lexical frequency analysis and um, showed that index signs, which which are typically pointing signs uh, for first person and third person, uh, were the most frequently used signs in the signs of Ireland corpus, uh, in the entire corpus, not just in the third of the corpus that I analysed. Um, so that's uh, quite significant as well. Um, depicting signs then are just including verbs and um uh, sorry depicting verbs and depicting nouns and interestingly enough uh, at 23 percent they make up half of the 46 percent of partly lexical signs um in the data set <clears throat> okay so uh i suppose that brings me um to the conclusions uh of the um presentation so i think so far i've presented the data um which provides insights into grammatical class usage, handedness, lexicality, and various other symbolic units. Um, I think once we have the data, it's not too difficult then to uncover these distributions uh, in the data set. The difficulty then is in the analysis and um, how you interpret that data. It needs to be, I think, interpreted in the context of previous literature. And <clears throat> It can. I mentioned earlier on that the data can help us help guide our research, but it can also support previous work or disprove uh, previous work, um, which is pretty cool. Um, I think the frequency data teaches us a lot about how language is used, um, and uh, it can help to inform future research. It can help to inform teaching and learning, uh, sign language dictionaries, uh, interpreting practices you know, um, computational processing um, and so on. So um, as I said, the the particular challenges that uh, Helen Cooper listed in her paper um, correlate quite well with the, um, the a huge amount of partly lexical and depicting signs from our, our data set. Um, so certainly, the frequency data teaches us that a lot of this data is going to be difficult or challenging uh, to process computationally. Um, I think results, the results, all the results I present here should be considered in the context uh, of uh, the language register, which in this case is a narrative language register. So all of the all of the language in the signs of Ireland corpus is, is narrative in nature. Um, you can also have language registers that are more formal or, or um you know more conversational uh, and so on um and they might throw up some slightly different um statistics um uh, but i think in general um this is a good indication um of what kind of information is out there um and what kind of um grammatical classes people are using so um i know this data has raised many questions some of them are answered in my dissertation so the, my, my PhD dissertation is titled uh, Exploiting Association Rule Mining to Inform the Use of Non-Manual Features in Sign Language Processing. That's a, a nice mouthful. Uh, and I've also published my appendix, um, which uh, the data in my appendix. So the data set is available, um, and so is a thesis on the publications page of my blog, uh, which is available at this link. So that's all I have. Um, I'll take questions now if anybody has any.